Via telephone, Senator Jason Barrett joining us here as the vice chair of GovOr. Good morning, sir. How are you? I'm doing well. Good morning. Good to have you with us. So, Thanks for having me. Let, let's talk about personal income tax. We had Senator Ryan Weld on yesterday, and he mentioned that the Senate wants to kind of put their own spin on how we get to 50% and gather more information. Jason, you're also on the Finance Committee. Maybe you can tell us a bit more about how that's going or will go. Well, I mean, it's going well, and we're, we're actively having discussions within our caucus and, and within the Finance Committee. And, and as I told you last week, we're we're going through the governor's list of a uh, billion dollars of spending to, to prioritize what we think is, is important um, and, and what we think is not. And, and I think it's important that, that all parties involved um, kind of go through that same process to, to figure out what, um, you know, what, what we need to spend money on and, and, what, we can, um, and what we can pass on and, and so that we can um, pass a meaningful uh, tax cut to the people of West Virginia. So is there more that the Senate wants than just a straight income tax cut? Is there anything else they want attached to that? And when I say they, I mean you because you're a senator. <laughs> well, I mean, like I said, we're, we're working through all of it. Um, you know, we, we recognize that, that a personal income tax, um, a, a large reduction in personal income tax does have uh, the economic impact that we're looking at. Um, I think that, that the problem has been if you're doing these 10 and 20 percent tax cuts uh, per to personal income tax, you really don't have the economic impact you're looking for. You have less revenue uh, for the state. You have obviously you've given some money back, and that's important. But th the Senate's position all along has been we want to do a tax cut that puts money in people's pockets, but also drives economic development, economic impact that, that we're looking for, um, you know, to propel West Virginia forward. Billy. Yeah, so uh, uh, so personal property, a rebate of personal property is still very much in the discussion of the Senate. Is that correct, Jason? I don't know that we've taken anything off the table, Bill. Okay. Well, by not taking off the table, that would imply that it's still a very active discussion. So. I think that's a fair statement. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Uh, so... Uh, uh, is do you see ha, you have any sense at all that the house will go along with a personal property rebate um, plan? I have no idea. Um, I haven't uh, talked to them too much about that issue. Uh, I am the uh, assistant caucus chair in the Senate, and, and I meet uh, weekly, at least weekly, with um, not only our caucus chair here in the Senate, but but with the House caucus chair and their assistant chair. So. Um, and we actually, uh, you know, do that once a week and, and have a good dialogue. And, you know, today is the 15th day, so we're only a quarter way through the session. There are a lot of bills that we've passed over already. Uh, this, the House certainly has priorities. So we're, we're working through those. Um, but we, I haven't had really discussions with the House of um, what they have to have and what they um, uh, is a non-starter for them. So. Uh, fair enough. Let me shift away from taxes. I may want to come back to in a couple of minutes. But a point of clarification. Uh, we were talking to Mike Hornby a couple of minutes ago, and DHHR came up. Uh, Mike was of the assumption that uh, the legislators would be leaning toward breaking DHHR into three groups, but under one COO. I is. Do you understand it that way, or th three departments under three separate COOs? Well, they're actually under secretaries, um, and so they're, they're cabinet-level positions. Yeah. The, the bill that we passed out of the Senate uh, does create uh, three cabinet yeah. secretaries. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that and the House is working through their own bill, I believe. I don't think that they're taking up our Senate bill. I think they're doing their own bill, and then we'll um, you know, work out the differences. But, but in the Senate bill... Uh, it does very much provide for three cabinet secretaries, and I think that's the right direction to go in. We, we, we've said all along that this, that this agency is too large, is too cumbersome for any one person um, to oversee, and so I think that's the need for, for three different secretaries. That's what I thought as well, three, sec uh, three secretaries, different secretaries, and not on, all under one. Okay, that, fair enough. So. Maria. So, um, Jason, do you think that the Senate, and more particularly Craig Blair, and I didn't have the opportunity to talk to him about this, are he and, and the governor ever going to like get together and sing Kumbaya or something on, on taxes? It seems like... Um, it seems like the Senate in general, the governor going around and around and around and 
and hopefully we'll come to some agreement at the end of the session, but you never know. I mean, there's a lot of acrimony there, yes? I don't expect them to break out in song, but but I certainly think that, that, you know, there are going to be negotiations and there are conversations already going on about um, the, the, the potential tax cut, what, where the governor is, what the governor is willing to uh, to negotiate on. And I think he's probably indicated I don't follow the governor's tweets or daily commentary, but it's my understanding that he has, you know, said some willingness to negotiate. So. Um, again, it's day 15. We got a long way to go, and, and I think that that you know, we'll figure it out. But we're not going to break out in song together. But at the end of the day, I think we'll come together and get something done. Okay, sounds good. Okay, uh, Jason, I'm going to go back uh, to a discussion we had with Mike a few minutes ago, and that was with Campus Carry. And Mike sure. and I realize it's passed out of the Senate, and in all probability, will pass uh, pass the House. Uh, my question to uh, Delegate Hornby was the level of hypocrisy that we have campus carry on campuses or carry on campuses, but in the government buildings we cannot. Now, one of the posters said, well, we do have, we have security in police. We have security in police in certain of the buildings, such as the, uh, the courthouses, but we do not have security in police in other government buildings, such as, in our case, the Dunn building. Uh, what's the, uh, uh, What's the difference between allowing campus carry on campuses, but not in our in all of our government buildings? Well, I mean, I think it's a fair question, and, and you're, the Dunn Building is a county building, not a state building. I mean, we're um, you know, so in the Capitol, there are armed security, there are metal detectors, and that's what um, the the bill provides. That if the if the university does does want to prohibit firearms, that that, that they have to have um, some form of protection, whether it be uh, armed security guards or metal detectors, uh, to ensure that um, you know someone is safe. And if they're not going to provide those things, then we have to allow folks uh, to be safe. Um, now, the, the, the difference is, but I, actually, Bill, I don't know that there is a difference because it's not illegal to go into that Dunn building with firearm, and it is not illegal right now to go on a campus university with a firearm. But the uh, the, the Dunn building is posted no firearms. That doesn't make it illegal, Bill. Uh, well, I, do, and, I don't know about this. Uh, you may well, be right, but this. well, you okay? Okay, <laughs> you probably. Let, but let I, but I, I've asked that question to uh, some of our legal authorities in the county, and they have not come back with a positive answer. Just well, yet. I mean, I, I'm happy to show them the code, but but the way that it works, if you have a sign that says no firearms, um, that's that's. You, you can take the fire in there legally, and as soon as they tell you to leave, and if you don't leave, then you're trespassing. And that's, that's exactly the way that it works on college campus. What the difference is, is that the penalty that the university can uh, assess to the, to the student is expulsion or, or uh, some type of suspension. If, if I go on a college campus right now as a non-student, and I go on Shepherd University's campus with a firearm, um, they can tell me to leave. Uh, but there's no law that I'm breaking by doing it. You good there, Bill? Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, I guess I. Well, yes, this is going to pass. We know it's going to pass. Uh, there's this has been foregone from day one, uh, even over the objections of the president of the of the universities and the vocal opposition by the student bodies on at least some of the universities, but. But we, they don't have a say so, not to the degree that the, uh, uh, our, the makeup of our current legislators have. Jason, let me ask well, you. Go ahead, finish. You, please respond. Well, I mean, what I was going to say is that, you know, there are a, a lot of students getting uh, back to us. I think there was uh, some type of poll done at, at, at WVU where uh, 51% of the, um, uh, it was about a 50-50 breakdown between those that thought they should not be allowed on campus and those that were okay with it or not opposed to it. I think it's a better term to do. Um, but the, uh, the, the, the student government or, or whatever the, the, the organization there is, even though it was that much of a split, they still voted uh, to be opposed to allowing firearms on campus. I've, I've re received emails from a lot of uh, college students, um, both at Shepherd, WVU, and, and other institutions in our state that are very much supportive of it. So, you know, I, I think if the university is not going to provide uh, a an area or, or they're not going to provide um, 
uh, a, a safe environment uh, where, where metal detectors are, are, are there or there are armed security to, to protect individuals, then we have to give them the opportunity. They should absolutely have the opportunity to protect themselves. Okay, fair enough. Let me pick up on one small one, one part of that. Uh, one of the exemptions is a gathering of a thousand or more. I would think that the risk would be greater in a gathering of a thousand or more than it would be in much smaller gathering. What's the reason for that exception? Well, I think that, you know, kind of probably what you saw in Las Vegas from a hotel room. I mean, I think that's, you know, when there are, um, you know, I think there would be a bigger target there. I would I would very much assume that if there's any gathering going on at a university with a thousand or more people, there would be armed security there. There should be. Um, and, I, again, I didn't put that in the bill. That would be a question to, to figure out, you know, who, um, what concession was made for that that particular provision. But, um, and that t- but I'm, that, I'm, I'm sure that with a 1,000 people, there's armed security there. That tends to be a football or basketball game yes. or some mm-hmm. other sports or concert or whatever where, where security is already provided. Uh, so I can mm-hmm. understand that uh, exception uh, to the rule. The, the people that are opposed to this, uh, and I don't go to college any longer, so I mean, it's, it's not, I don't have skin in the game and I don't have kids in college any longer at, at that point. But he, here's the thing I come back to on this, uh, Jason. So the person who wants to kill people and is willing to die doing it on campus doesn't have any concern about taking a gun onto the campus because it's a suicide mission for that person. But the rest of the folks who are abiding by the law or the request or wishes of the university, and aren't bringing firearms onto the campus, are effectively sacrificial lambs to the idiot who's willing to die to do what he wants to do or she wants to do. So that leaves the rest of us law-abiding citizens at a severe disadvantage if we can't protect ourselves on on a campus. And I know the thought is that, well, if if 40,000 people on the WU campus have guns, it's just going to be a wily coyote Wild West shootout every day. You know, or as soon as someone gets upset, they're going to turn around and shoot somebody. But the fact of the matter is, if we're going to have these environments, then we should have the right to protect ourselves. If, if, we well, don't, that, if there's no other resolution to this, and there isn't, if there was, we'd have fixed it and stopped mass shootings already, and we haven't. So if there's no other solution, you better give me the right to protect myself in this situation. Because this is the well, environment we now live in, 38 mass shootings in this country in January alone. Well, that's a very rational and common sense way to look at it, Rob. I would agree with you. I'm sorry it has come to this, but I don't see any other way to protect myself in these situations. Do you? No. And, and your point about the, the individual that wants to, you know, that's on a suicide mission, well, they're going to a college campus right now. They're probably not on a suicide mission because there's no one there uh, that's able to protect themselves. So it, it, it very well may not be a suicide mission because they might be the only person there that's armed. I want to go to uh, an odd transition to sales taxes um, from this. Uh, Doug Cope and everyone, he was president of the Berkeley County Council, repeatedly asked for a 1% sales tax option for uh, Berkeley County. Steve Catlett. New to the council, just mentioned the same thing one more time. Tell me how we get to some kind of an agreement with growth counties like Berkeley County for a way to provide the funds that they need if it can't be a sales tax. Because I know the, I know the Republican-controlled legislature is in no mood to, to raise taxes. I get that. Well, I mean, I don't think... You know, it's kind of hard to go raise taxes when you've got these huge surpluses. Um, you know, well, I, we're not distributing them back to the people, so it doesn't matter. Well, we're getting there. Just be patient. Um, <laughs> you, you know, I, I, look, I, I agree. I think that one of the, the – again, my plan when we were talking about getting rid of the personal property tax uh, was allowing counties to institute a 1% sales tax as part of keeping them whole uh, and not being so reliant on the state sending out uh, the entire amount of money – essentially making counties whole. I wanted some of that generated in the county uh, the same way property tax collection is. Uh, so if I'd had my way, that's the way it would have been. Um, consumer sales tax increase or, or consumer sales tax uh, for counties right now is, is a heavy lift in the legislature. There's no question. And, and Berkeley and Jefferson counties do an excellent job with the money they have. Um, I can assure you that other counties across the state are not quite as efficient. You know, I think there are right now we're, we're working on some things, and I'm, I'm working on a bill that um, uh, deals with the, the jail costs for counties. Um, and I think that, the, you know, I'm working on a scenario that 
would re actually reduce the uh, jail bill for Berkeley County and free up some money. But um, you know, to your point, it's, it's a heavy lift right now, uh, giving counties the option. Uh, I think some of that is because there are a lot of, a lot of legislators that think that uh, cities have used, put, implemented the one percent sales tax, uh, and, and a lot of them didn't reduce taxes the way that um, a lot of legislators expected them to do. Uh, and I think that they kind of um, see the same thing going on with counties. Um, so I, I mean, I think that's that's certainly an obstacle. But as we look at overall tax reform, if that's the direction we're going to go, you know, I can see a scenario where a one percent county sales tax would be uh, part of that uh, overall tax reform. So there's a pathway, Maria. Another, well, I think so, but it's tough. It's tough this year for sure. Another weird transition because we're just all over the place this morning, okay. Senator. Um, so I have not heard very much about locality pay. As you point out, we're 15 days in, so um, lots of time to to move around. That's something you felt very strongly about, if I recall, during the the forums. Um, so how do you go about introducing, moving that forward? Um, I, I, I don't know that it starts in finance, but you have a role in finance. So talk about that a little bit. Well, I have introduced a bill already this year that uh, gives um, uh, the Secretary of Homeland Security uh, flexibility uh, with locality pay for correction workers. Uh, okay. I think that's uh, certainly a big issue right now. Uh, I'm at and working on one for the state police as well. Uh, and then another one is, is and I don't get too far into this one because um, I don't have it on paper yet, but, but we're, we are actively drafting it right now. Um, and that is a, an across the board um, locality pay plan um, for all state workers. Um, and so I think that, that really what we need to do, rather than the legislature um, go to every state agency and tell them exactly the way locality pay should be implemented, I think maybe we should look at, at these state agencies for them to develop and implement a plan. So I think that's the direction I'm going to try to go. And, and frankly, because corrections and the state police brought these ideas to us last year about locality pay. So, um, you know, I think that, that the agencies who have identified a problem, they're, they're well aware of uh, the cost of housing in the Eastern Panhandle and how hard it is to recruit and retain public employees. Um, so I think that, that maybe we should give them the flexibility uh, to implement some locality pay. But not teachers? Well, well, I mean, yes, but we'd have to, it has to be in a separate bill. Teachers are actually county employees, uh, and their salaries are set in code very much like the state police. Okay. Uh, and with the exception of them, school service personnel and DNR, all other state employees, uh, their salaries are uh, in the budget bill. Um, and it's a lot easier to go in and, and give that flexibility to those agencies that don't have employees with uh, a set pay scale in code. So it, it's, it's a little harder uh, to manage, and it, you have to be a little more creative about how you do it with um, teachers and school service personnel, those that have actual set uh, salary scale in code. Okay. But, Thank but, you. but it, absolutely, it's you know, teachers, you know, are very much near the top of the list or at the top of the list as it relates to locality pay. Senator, let me do another jump. Uh, we uh, talking to uh, Mike Hornby earlier, and Highway 9 West came up. And Mike made the mention that the Eastern Panhandle uh, caucuses have discussed the issue considerably. Uh, all of us realize that we're not going to have a solution or resolution overnight. It's going to be years. Uh, but the sense I got from, from Mike is that there's at least a lot of serious talk about it and hopefully it will direct uh, be extended over to the Department of Highways. Do you have any sense at all uh, how serious the discussion would be and can we expect highways to start taking serious action on Highway 9 through Hedgesville? Well, I, I mean, that's certainly my hope and my goal and we've, uh, you know, Mike's right, we've had uh, numerous discussions amongst ourselves regarding Route 9. Many of us have reached out to highways you know, to make the case for Route 9. Uh, so I, I think as you start to see some of these other projects uh, get, get completed, um, you know, I think that's the time when, you know, we really need to look at, at Route 9 moving forward. And um, I, I think it would be tremendous uh, to Morgan County uh, and to Western Berkeley County 
Uh, you look at the population growth in both Berkeley and Jefferson uh, over the past decade, and Morgan has stayed relatively flat. Uh, and I think that, that, that Route 9 is one of the reasons why uh, their growth, um, they haven't seen the, the, the type of growth that we have in, the Eastern, in, in Berkeley and Jefferson uh, because of access um, you know, to, to 81 and access to, to the areas in which folks would travel to work. Um, so I, I think that's uh, I think it's a it's a really a big deal for Morgan County and Western Berkeley. Final thirty seconds, Jason. They are yours. Anything people need to know, you're doing. Well, we're working really hard, and, and I really enjoy my time so far in the first fifteen days of the Senate. Uh, it is uh, the Senate is very different from the House that it's the same amount of work, but there are only a third of us doing it. So uh, it's a it's a heavy schedule. Um, I, I like the change and. Uh, it's, we're, we're getting things accomplished, and, and so I'm very optimistic that we're going to come to an agreement on a tax reduction for the people of West Virginia. Jason, thanks so much for your time this morning. As always, appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Th- thanks, Senator. 